I'm very excited to have the opportunity to talk to you about about this topic and I know it's something that you're very passionate about as well. Um, and, and to that end, I suppose the first question we had is, you know, what does a, a diverse and inclusive culture mean to you? I think ultimately it's about belonging. I think that in if we really crack this, if we get this right, if you truly have a diverse culture, an inclusive culture, that eventually will lead you to a sense of belonging. And belonging is about not feeling like you're in an alien environment. And when you talk to people and you really get under the skin of people when they feel that somewhere isn't inclusive to them, it's that feeling of not belonging. It's feeling that somehow they're not quite accepted on their own terms. And I certainly, when I look back on my, um, on my own journey, that feeling of being an outsider was definitely there for a big part of the beginning part of that journey, because I didn't have a family background in financial services or indeed in business. I mean, it was just totally alien to the environment I grew up in. So I think at its heart, we succeed when we create a sense of of belonging, that we have a culture that everyone can feel they genuinely belong in and to, and have a right to be there without apology. Um, so I think that's the ambition. That's what we're trying to get at. And I think the next logical question from that is, what is the best way, do you think, to build that culture? I think it's one of these problems that is multidimensional. And when you break down all the different things that you have to do, you can't be prescriptive. It can't be command and control. But there are some elements you do have to tackle in the way that you would tackle any other business problem, which is think about the processes, think about the stakeholders, break everything down, analyze every individual step from recruitment to your process around promotion to your pro process around performance evaluation, all of those things. Analyze each step and then try and take a really lateral view what is it that you are missing? Start from the premise that it's not working. And if it's not working, what would that look like? And does that then look like what you already have? So I think doing that very, um, quite, you know, quite technical, but very process oriented analysis will help you create a framework, which is much more likely to drive you towards a fair, a more equal, um, both opportunity set and outcome set. But it's not enough, necessary, but not sufficient. And the other part of the, anything to do with culture is you've also got to take hearts and minds with you. People have to believe that what you are doing is right. And they have to believe that your motivation is right. And they have to understand that they have a voice in helping identify when things are not right. So active listening really, really important, but you then have to take what you hear and translate that again into an action plan, into concrete steps and create that feedback loop. And so the whole issue of culture generally is one which is fascinating from a kind of organizational psychology point of view, but specifically how you create a culture which doesn't just produce great business outcomes, but creates great people outcomes. That's about hearts and minds as well as the hard processes. And, you know, and, that, and it's a multi-year thing. It can be lost very quickly. It can take many years to build and can be lost very quickly. So those are some of the things that you have to think about in an organizational sense. Sure. And I think it's a really interesting parallel and perhaps one that I isn't talked about that much in terms of addressing the challenge as a business in the same way you would a business problem. I think we work in organizations with lots of very bright, engaging people that can tackle those very complex challenges and I don't think we've necessarily applied that same framework to the inclusive inclusion and diversity efforts today um so so aside from hearts and minds are there any other challenges that you think that that make taking that framework and applying it in the same context more difficult in an inclusion and diversity context well there's, there's multiple different um strands you know people don't identify as a single thing you know, we all have a cultural background, we have a socioeconomic background, we have a gender background, we come from different family environments, different religious environments, or no religious environment at all. And when I look around, you know, we work in more than 25 different countries, and in every single one of those countries, 
the profile of the local community that we work in is very different. So when you try and build up a picture to the organization as a whole, success might look completely different in our Indian office, for example, to the way that it might look in our Tokyo office or in the way that it might look in our Dublin office or in our German office or in our UK offices. So it can look very different. And one of the challenges is how you can get something that is meaningful and relevant to every single piece of that quite complex puzzle, which is why things like targets are quite difficult to to set in isolation because they will look very different for a different company that has a different geographic footprint. And actually, even within the UK, that's true. So I think one of the challenges is how you create the, the right sets of incentives and targets that are appropriate to the business, but are also right and inclusive to the totality of the population that you have within your organization. And it is a challenge. It's definitely a challenge. Indeed. And I think that you touched upon a really interesting point there around progression and how success is measured. And I think as we talk about inclusion and diversity and it's getting a lot, you know, the right kind of attention, I would say now, I think it's very focused at the sharp end in terms of recruitment, right? Which is absolutely from a low base where we have to start. But I think the progression is is the next bastion that we have to tackle, which is it leads into an interesting question in that, you know, the female representation, certainly at your level, at CEO level, um, is, is low still. Um, so what, how about your specific journey in terms of becoming CEO and, and how, what were some of the challenges there that you overcame and, and what do you think led to your success in that regard? Okay, well, it was about three different questions in there. Oh, sorry. But, <laughs> but I think the thing that I would say is when I look now at my peers and my cohort, I could let, reel off in financial services half a dozen female CEOs right now today without thinking too hard about it. 20 years ago, that was not the case. So with a long way to go, we have made a lot of progress. And I think we, sh- you know, I think there's all sorts of reasons for that, but a very concerted push on gender has unquestionably helped that. And I think it's right and appropriate that we apply the same lens to other aspects of DNI, albeit in a way gender is the most straightforward, not necessarily to solve as a problem, but to identify in terms of things like the numbers and the targets. Um, in terms of my own um, journey, so I mean, you know, I did start as something of an outsider. Um, I went to the local comprehensive school. Um, Maths was sort of my thing, but I, for various reasons, figured that pure maths was never going to be something I wanted to study. And a very um, wonderful and inspiration, inspirational physics teacher pointed me in the direction of engineering, um, which I then went to university and absolutely loved it because engineering is all about problem solving. And, you know, I like, yeah, that's what I like doing, basically. And he, he, he identified that. And it was incredibly insightful and helpful when he said, what you really like doing is solving problems get all this highfalutin math stuff actually you like coming out with the answer at the end of it it's not a philosophical thing it's a practical thing and I think that was really really helpful to, when somebody just gives you that moment of clarity to study engineering it didn't come from a business background at all so I suppose in a family environment you know we understood what a teacher was we understood what a doctor was but you know beyond that even engineering was a bit weird you know there was no engineers in my family so um I went to CERN as a research fellow because really I was thinking an academic career. That's that sort of seemed to be the path that I was on. Loved CERN, loved it being in Switzerland. Um, you know, I like mountains, no better place in the world if you like yeah. mountains pretty much than Switzerland and Scotland, I suppose. Um, but I gradually began to realise that that kind of pure research world, it, you know, it somehow lacked something. I didn't really know what it lacked, but it, it lacked something for me. So with a bit of a heavy heart in a funny kind of way, I uh, came back to the UK and went to work for a firm of technology consultants, began to manage projects, began to get quite interested in actually how you manage a project to successful completion. And from that discovered something called an MBA, which I had not heard of before, um, and applied to go back to Europe, to INSEAD, to study for an MBA. I love the MBA. I love the range of subjects that we studied. but probably that driver towards the interest in financial markets is what took me to uh, to think about a job in financial services. But I didn't know, I didn't understand 
yeah. the difference between all the different sorts of jobs that you get in financial services, an investment manager, an investment banker, a stockbroker, all sounds the same when someone describes it to you. So uh, I accepted a job as an engineering analyst because I was an engineer and I had an MBA, so I could be an analyst and uh, went to work for an investment management firm. Um, and you know, I loved it. And I very quickly moved from an analyst to managing money to a fund manager. I then got the opportunity to run a team which I jumped at and I really enjoyed managing a team of fund managers. I then got offered a job as chief investment officer of a, of a smaller firm. Um, so I said yes to that. We then hit the financial crisis of 2002, 2003, when the dot-com bubble burst um, and ended up selling that business to Aberdeen Asset Management, where I stayed as chief investment officer for something like 12, 13 years and loved it. And from that, gradually realized that I would like a crack at a chief executive role myself. And I got offered the chief executive job at m and um, which I did for a couple of years. And then finally was offered the job of chief executive at Fidelity International, which had a certain homecoming feel for me because the very first analyst position I applied for back in my MBA days was Fidelity. And they turned me down. <laughs> So I waited a long time to get that job. So that's my little story of, of my progression to chief executive. I think that's, that's incredible. Uh, and I think the variety of roles, and I think that's something that is critical for young people looking at the industry is the variety of backgrounds and roles. And it isn't a pure economics math background that's required to be successful in the industry. So I think that's super important. I, I think one interesting aspect you mentioned was the kind of intervention of, of, of a physics teacher at secondary school that kind of sent you down the path of engineering. And, and that brings on an interesting question around the importance of role models and mentors and, and, and how they've had an impact on your career and whether you still maintain, um, you know, role models, mentors, that kind of stuff and, 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 and how you engage with them. I know there's multiple questions in there again. <laughs> so it, it's really interesting. So, you know, the, my physics teacher, I suppose, is now we, he was both a mentor and a sponsor. That's what you say. I'm still in touch with him, by the way. He's an absolutely charming, charming, wonderful man. Um, so I think it does. Having somebody who understands what makes you tick really helps. And it actually doesn't necessarily need very much. It just needs that moment of clarity when it matters. Um, and it's quite hard to prescribe that, which is why I'm not totally convinced about formal mentoring programs, although I know some people find them super helpful. So if they work for you, I think that's terrific. I know that I don't think they work for everybody, but if they work for you, that, that's absolutely brilliant. Um, in terms of role models, there have been you know, multiple people along the way who have been, who have believed in me and who have helped me. Um, you know, Steve Goldman and Jeff Lindy at JP Morgan, for example, unquestionably gave me chances that I'm deeply grateful for and showed me what a good manager, what a good leader looked like. And so that's really important. I think the other person who was, um, was, was a role model, although I wouldn't necessarily have obviously said that at the time, was Carol Galley, who ran, was the chief executive of Mercury Asset Management. And very unusual for a woman at that time. And the fact that a woman was running such a large and important business, subliminally, subconsciously, I think, showed me that it was possible. So I think she was a real um, role model for the industry as a whole. And I think I probably owe her a huge um, debt of gratitude just for the fact that she toughed it out. But I think the thing is about role models is they don't necessarily have to look like you. It's just people who you want to emulate because you admire them and you respect them. And so you don't necessarily have to have somebody who looks exactly like you. You have to have somebody who you think you have a, an empathetic connection with and you believe that you could be that person if you got up to that role. And so I think that's something that's just worth bearing in mind. In terms of today, um, it's less about role models, I think, now. I, I But I do really value the peer network that I have across the industry, people who've had lots of different paths, who are doing big jobs, tough jobs, but who are good people who are willing to be there to help if you need a bit of confidential insight and you just want to bounce some ideas around. So I think the power of peer networking is really important. And again, 
I think I've had that the whole way as I've gone up. And I, so again, I would recommend that. Create that peer group of people who you trust, whose judgment you value, who you can have a bit of fun with along the way and can be a bit of a pressure valve for you when it all gets too much. I think that's as important as role models. Super. And I think there's, there's, there's lots of really interesting points in there. I think, you know, we're coming towards the end of, of the interview. What, what advice, and, and similar to myself, I've come from a very, you know, I came from a politics background. I grew up in and, and went to university in the financial crisis. So it's pretty adamant financial services wasn't for me. And yet here I am having these types of conversations. Well done. Well done. Established career. So I think one, one thing that I'm really keen to understand is what advice you would give to, to young people and, and future generations who are, are perhaps from atypical backgrounds that haven't got, you know, aren't familiar with the, with the financial markets or even, you know, the differences, as you said before, between an investment manager, an investment banker, a broker, et cetera. What, what is, you know, the advice that you'd give to them who want a career in finance and have maybe fat, stumbled the way upon a career in finance as an opportunity? Yeah. Gosh, lots of different things. I mean, one one piece of advice I would give to my younger self is to worry less because definitely I was, you know, I was always agonizing over all sorts of stuff. Most of it I couldn't control. So, you know, only worry about the stuff that you can control um, and work really hard to on the stuff that you can control to be your best possible self, to do the best job that you can. So you know, now with the internet, with the web, it's much easier to do research. I mean, my ignorance now, if I had the same level of ignorance now as I had then, there'd be no excuse for it. It was quite hard to get the information 30 years ago, much easier now. So you do have to do the legwork. You do have to do your research. And if you don't have people in the family, you can ask, maybe you have to do a bit more research. So I think that does definitely put, it, put in the hours. Um, few other things. I think being a problem solver is a good place to be. If people know that if there's a tricky thing that they can't get to the bottom of and you're somebody that actually will help them do that, that's quite powerful. So if you can be somebody that um, actually helps other people with the challenges that they face, you develop a lot of respect for that. So I think being a problem solver and not a problem maker. And we all know there are people in the workplace who yeah. seem to make more trouble than they than they than problems that they solve. So you know, think about being a problem solver. And then finally, when it comes to the actual content of the job, I never set out to be anything. I didn't. Know, I didn't know what a chief executive was. Let's be honest. Yeah. I did over time become clearer and clearer and clearer about how I wanted to feel. I knew what I wanted to feel in a job. For me, one of the big drivers is autonomy. I, I like autonomy. I like the power to succeed or fail based on, you know, I'll, I'll take the flack for doing it, but I want, I, I don't really worry so much about some of the other things that sometimes motivate people around status and salary and other things, although I've been very lucky in all of those things autonomy is more important to me intrinsically and it's different for everybody everybody has a different driver um so think about the things that make you feel good in a job and try and make your next job a thing that gives you more of the things that you feel good about so when I moved from running a small team to becoming CIO it was actually because I liked that feeling of having my arms around the whole group harder to do in a larger company. So I took the view to move to a much, much smaller company, arguably in some ways a smaller job, but where I had the autonomy. And that worked out well for me, wouldn't necessarily, could have worked out very differently, but that's okay. But if you know what you're moving towards in terms of how you feel in a job, that's, I think, very, very powerful. And it will take you into all sorts of places. Be willing to say yes to stuff that takes you out your comfort zone is also important, I think. Um, and, you know, and that's the best advice I can give because everybody's different. Everybody has a different path to follow and you know what makes you feel good and just try and do a bit more of it day, every day. Excellent. That's uh, great advice. I suppose one final question from me then is just, 
you know, we talked a lot about the the challenges and, and how to address some of those and, and some of the strides that have been made, you know, and, and I think it's very apt coming from yourself in terms of the, the progress from a female CEO perspective. What do you think in the next, in the, in the medium term, success looks like within our industry from an inclusion and diversity perspective? I think we will be recruiting from a much broader mix of of universities, of colleges. I think apprenticeships have been great as a different way in. And I think when you look at the leadership, you will have a much broader um, mix of people at, you know, at, at the top end of businesses that we all run. And I think that will be the visible measure of success. I think just in terms of how we are perceived as an industry though the real success will be if we are seen as a progressive industry where people think when they come out of school yeah I really want to get a job in that industry that means that we've started to to really move the needle on the dial on that but we have to make the experience for the people that are already in our industry good and truthful to that vision and by doing that, we will then create that, that, that effect, that echo that will go out into society um, more widely. I mean, I, the, the, what we do looking after, which is ultimately looking after people's long-term financial futures, is really important. If you look at any society that lacks a well-functioning provision for, for example, old age savings, that's not a good place to be. What we do is really important and we need to do it well and we need to do it responsibly. And that sense of that is the that should be the ethic that sits behind what we do as an industry, look after other people's money and do it really well. That's something that should be quite motivating for young people as well, I think. So understanding the purpose of the industry and being able to 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 take that message out. If we do that well, we'll have succeeded. Excellent. I think that's everything on my list and it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and appreciate again how busy things are. So, so do really appreciate you making the time to have the conversation. Um, and I look forward to seeing all the efforts that Fidelity and the rest of the industry do to continue to, to deliver that vision, hopefully in the medium term. Well, thanks. Thanks for giving me the chance to talk to you. It's been, it's been a great conversation. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Excellent.